We start our walking tour at the top of the village, opposite the Rath. Our Rath is located behind the Garda station, which was a two-roomed boys' national school. From 1910, generations of boys attended there, including myself. The Rath of Oman is our most important surviving historical structure. The survival of Raths illustrates the continuity of settlement for well over a thousand years. The local Rath gave the village its name. Though we don't know who Amon was, it is satisfying to have a place name that is called after a historical monument that still exists. Matthew Stout says there was over 45,000 enclosed farmsteads or rats in Ireland. He argued that Rathangan Rat is one of the few rats that can be dated from historical sources. He said, mainly based on the evidence of an early Irish poem, that the Rathangan Rat dates from 579 to 652 AD. Others argue that it may be older. This poem contains evidence of the rat's earliest occupants. The fort opposite the oak wood. Once it was breeders, it was cohels, it was A's, it was Alils, it was Cunnings, it was Cullinas, and it was Maildoons. The fort remains, after each in his turn, and the kings asleep in the ground. Seven generations of notables stress the high status of the place according to the famed historian Otway Ruthven. By the Middle Ages, Rathangan Stone Castle had replaced the Rath as the local power base. Alas, the castle did not survive. There is evidence of the Rath being altered in the Middle Ages. It is described in O'Donovan's letters in 1837 as follows. This mound is at present planted about 180 feet in diameter and measures from its base to its summit slantwise about 42 feet which would make it 28 feet in the perpendicular. The reference to planting is to trees which still adorn the rath. Some of the trees were removed during World War II for firewood. On Roke's map of Rathangan, from 1760, trees are clearly depicted. Luckily, the rath has survived. We as young children rarely went into it. Instead, we rolled in the hollow field nearby. Now we head in the direction of the village and enter the Church of Ireland Gate beside the Garda Station, and we proceed up the long tree-lined avenue. The present Church of Ireland is mostly an 18th and 19th century structure. It is in use and well maintained. The list of rectors and vicars date back to 1476. These include Tottenham, Jesson, Watson and Bourne. In 1816, Bourne made an application for a loan of £150 to complete the church which, though erected in 1770, was never finished. A copper arms dish with the inscription The Gift of Daniel Lennon of the City of Dublin to the Church of Rathangan in 1770 was probably presented to mark its opening. Fortunately, there is an inscription over the main door that says Rebuilt, 1828, by Reverend William Bourne Rector, confirming that there was a church there previously. An early church stone close to the church suggests that this was the site of Rathangan's pre-Reformation church. The adjoining graveyard was used for both Church of Ireland and Catholic residents. James Spencer of 1798 is buried here. He was murdered during that conflict. The large tomb is next to the church. His monument reads as follows. Underneath lies the remains of James Spencer of Rathangan County Kildare, who died on the 26th of May, 1798, in the 67th year of his age. This monument was erected in his memory by his eldest daughter, Esther, wife of the Honourable and Reverend John Pomeroy. John and Michael Dorley from Lullymore, who played a prominent part in 1798, are buried here. Thomas Bean, executed by the Free State during the Civil War, is also interred in this graveyard. We return now down the Church Avenue there is a small green facing us that has an attractive flower bed dedicated to the novelist B.M. Croker. An attractive feature of Rathangan are the monuments to three well-known writers. Rathangan Tidy Towns erected a monument on this green to the writer B.M. Croker. This talented lady deserves to be remembered. She published over 50 novels and a number of ghost stories. She married John Croker in 1871. John was a military man based in the Curragh. They went to India, where Bithya wrote most of her novels. One of her novels, Bridget, published in 1918, has several references to Rathangan. Bithya died on the 20th of October, 1920. So we proceed down the main street, 
we noticed that there are a large number of big Georgian houses on both sides of the street. These were the houses with the higher valuations in Griffith's service. The late Mrs. Bagnell told me that they used to refer to the top of the town as the Rat Mines End. A plaque on the wall tells us that Leinster Street was built 1792. This street name reminds us that Rathangan was part of the Duke of Leinster's vast estates. We now pass through the square. It was often referred to as Paradise Square. My mam Nancy used to live here in the 1940s, as did her dad, James Reardon, who had a shop in the square. Today, it is not a square, but a triangle. We now take the walkway along the banks of the Slater River, which directly leads to Maura Laverty's monument. The multi-talented writer Maura Laverty was born in Rathangan. Her mother was an avid dressmaker and her father was a reluctant shopkeeper. She wrote five novels, including the controversial novel Never No More, which was set in Rathangan. She wrote three plays, including the script by the TV series Tal Corot. Maura was known as the Mammy of Irish Cookery. Her most famous book was called Full and Plenty. Maura Laverty was the most versatile female Irish writer between 1940 and the mid-1960s. One of her favourite sayings was, Cooking is the poetry of housework. Maura was a presenter on radio, a playwright and a novelist of distinction. It's fitting that Rathangan has a monument to her. She died in July 1966 at the age of 59. Now we walk back to the square, turn left in the direction of Kildare. We head towards the Grand Canal, and then we come across a monument to William Bourne. The poet William Bourne, who was born in Rathangan in 1872, was the son of a teacher, Joseph Bourne, and his wife, Marcella. William attended the primary school where his father taught. He later attended Maynooth College Seminary, but he left before being ordained. Before he left, he wrote the ode for the college centenary, 1895. His only poetry book is called A Light on the Broom. His most famous poem, The Purple Heather, resonates with bog connections. Fittingly, his monument today is surrounded with lovely purple heather. The purple heather is the cloak God gave the bogland brown, but man has made a pall of smoke to hide the distant town. His words bring back memories of turf cutters of yesteryear. We cleave the sodden shelving bank in sunshine and in rain that men by winter fires may thank the wielders of the slain. Bourne's poem, The Village, refers to Rathangan. It is the village that I love, lying down beside the stream. There's a belfry where the sun seems to perch at eve and rest, and a churchyard where the faithful with their arms upon their breast hear no more the gentle call they answered well. Now we head towards Rathangan Bridge. The Grand Canal greatly helped the development of Rathangan. Most of the main street was built in the 1790s, a decade after the coming of the canal. That is no coincidence. One of the attractions of Rathangan is the picturesque Grand Canal side location. This was even more true in previous centuries, especially as Rathangan did not have the railway, unlike Kildare, Monastraven, Newbridge and Atai. There are two canal bridges in the village. The first is called Rathangan Bridge. It is sometimes called Balloon Bridge, as the reflection of the moon creates a circular image under the bridge. The large grain store nearby was once thriving. In Slater's directory in 1881, Murphy Brothers were listed as the agents of the Grand Canal Company. Later, these buildings were owned by D.E.W. Williams of Tullamore Jew fame, There was a military barracks here in 1798. The Tangan was the site of a major battle. We now walk along the canal bank for a few hundred metres towards Monastraven to the second canal bridge. This is called Spencer Bridge after James Spencer of 1798. It was called that from the beginning as a map by John Killally in 1787 shows. The bridge has the date 1784 inscribed upon it. Spencer Bridge has very impressive double lock. Close by, there is an attractive lockkeeper's house. Rathangan is on the barrow line linking Dublin to its eye. The Grand Canal Company dates from the 1770s, and the first passenger boat travelled from Dublin to Salins in 1780. In July 1815, a journey on a passage boat from Dublin to Rathangan cost seven shillings and six old pence in a first-class cabin. Numbers were limited to 45 in first class 
and to 35 in second class. Meals were available, but no wine or spirits were sold in second class. One early timetable suggests that a boat left Hazel Hatch near Selbridge at 8.15am and arrived in Rathangan at 1pm. So we conclude, generations have come here and have made their contributions. My book, A Ramble in Rathangan in 2005, showcased Rathangan's rich heritage. Others like Larry Fulham and John O'Born are now doing likewise. I conclude with the insightful words of the Rathangan poet, William A. Bourne. And one by one the lights go out, and one by one we drop away, and other lights are on the hills, and other singers have the day.